Hey folks, going live here, Sunday breakfast with the coach session. Hopefully you all turned your clocks ahead. So daylight savings time here in North America. Not sure where you are, but um, yeah. So hopefully people have uh, slept in, turned their clocks ahead, realized what time it is, and are getting on board. So I'm just going to wait for some people to arrive, and then... Um, a few topics to discuss with you guys and then I'll leave it open for your questions so um, we'll wait for the list to build <coughs> hopefully people are enjoying your Sunday ask me anything sessions uh, morning MK I don't know if that's short for mark or not also don't forget um, enrollment is still open in my program design masterclass um, learn all about program design um, you know, uh, extensive, really in-depth stuff, so learn all about that at uh, programdesignmasterclass.com. That's programdesignmasterclass.com, http colon double slash, all that stuff. Um, so yeah, so keep, keep an eye on that. Uh, enrollment's limited for maybe the first week or so. Uh, two weeks, I think, we're going to leave enrollment open this time. Um, maybe longer, depends on, on demand, but it has its own website now, so... That's programdesignmasterclass.com, uh, so um, I can type in a link after we're done, uh, if you like. So um, keep those things in mind. So I'm just uh, saying hey while we're waiting for the audience to build. Building pretty quick uh, today, which is nice. That means you guys are enjoying your um, Sunday morning breakfast with the coach. If there's any questions before I get going, uh, by all means... Uh, Morning from Kansas. Is it daylight savings times there? I'm not sure. Uh, Puerto Rico. All right. Good. People are coming in fast and furious, so I'll get to your uh, questions in a second. Um, let's start with something simple. So let's start with the fact that it is daylight savings time here, which means that we um, turn the clocks ahead an hour, um, so we lose an hour's sleep. And uh, with that, you should look at the research that shows how Fender benders, accidents, um, basic illnesses, things like that, increase the day of daylight savings time. So I wanted to bring that to your attention um, because it's important. So imagine just one hour of sleep deprivation and the statistics show an increase in accidents and decrease in reaction times and all that. So a couple things there. Imagine if you're chronically sleep deprived, if you're chronically depriving yourself of the sleep that you need both in terms of quality and quantity. Imagine the effect that has on your productivity and performance. Uh, even something as simple as weight loss goals or fat loss goals. Something to keep in mind there. Um, obviously also uh, keep in mind what that says for people who can't be in control of their own biorhythms, your own natural rhythms. Maybe you're naturally a morning person. Maybe you're naturally um, and a night owl, you know, those things. But maybe you have work that takes your body in the opposite direction. So um, I remember um, I remember when I was putting myself through school, I had a midnight shift job at a hotel and uh, absolutely hated it. And it completely threw my body off. And it was one of those things where I just quit. I was like, it wasn't worth what it was doing to my body. So um, daylight savings time reminds me of a lot of those things. Um, so um, there's something to keep in mind. You look up the stats, you see accidents increase, and that's just uh, on daylight savings time when we, when we uh, leap ahead. And that's just one hour. So imagine some, if you're chronically sleep deprived. So people tend to underestimate the impact of very general things when it comes to health, wellness, physique transformation, and things like that. So, um, okay. Um, Everyone loving hear seeing and, and hearing about Andy, but they'd love a female client. Yeah, I would too. It's just the female clients tend to be a little more um, guarded about coming online and things like that um, and, and doing a whole lot of self-revealing. Um, and, of course, Andy lives here, so that's easy for me. A lot of the female clients that I have would, who would be amenable to... Uh, doing Facebook Live and stuff with me, I mean, they just don't live here. So, um, you know, I, my clients are all over the world, so let, let's, uh, we have to keep that in mind as well. Andy moved here specifically 
uh, to be with me and to follow as a protege and really make the leap from um, client and mentee to you know full mentorship and absorbing everything. So um, yeah. So um, okay. Uh, questions. If your last meal is seven, then I, there's no finish to that <laughs> sentence. Um, compulsive eating. Uh, how could should a compulsive eater manage tolerable hunger? Well, you're kind of answering your own question. Now, compulsive eating is an emotional disorder. It's an order of impulse control. Um, so it has nothing to do really with the physiology of hunger other than allowing hunger to be... Um, a physiological thing that you turn into an emotional trigger so you actually have a choice in that you're choosing a lot of people do this they they filter physiological sensations and they use them as emotional triggers and excuses for behavior so tolerable hunger is just something you get used to if you study the most um, naturally lean people who don't diet and things like that what you see is a a level of tolerable hunger and that they don't think a lot about food. It's just not something that occupies their mind. So <clears throat> um, that's sort of my emphasis. What I like to do when I'm working with people is not have them think more about food, have them think less about food. Um, I think uh, last week when we, did the, when we did the exercise of don't think about zebras for the next minute, I think I was driving home that point. I've dealt with a lot of ladies coming out of um, inpatient rehab for eating disorders, so pretty severe level eating disorders, and it always amazed me that the level of professional function um, was all about uh, behavior modification. So they were rewarded if they ate all their food, and they were uh, rewarded with food if they did X, and if they didn't do, then they lost privileges and things like that, and to me, um, that made no sense at all because all it does is cement in their thinking that food is a constant to think about and to use as, um, as reward or punish, um, which is, of course, what underlines the disorder to begin with. So that made no sense to me. So I, I approach it from a totally different, more zen-like um, philosophy, which is right thinking leads to right behavior. So um, that, that kind of thing there. So um, if someone is overweight and out of shape, what type of prep programs you usually prescribe before they start any time of programs at full speed? Usually just whole body, just whole body stuff. Obviously you need an assessment there because it depends on just how overweight someone is. There's a difference between being 40 pounds overweight and being 100 pounds overweight uh, in terms of program assignment. But obviously when you're that overweight, then as I like to say, then your body becomes a barbell. Um, you can use the extra weight is resistance, so even things like walking on a treadmill becomes a form of resistance training that you can use. So it, it's important not to overwhelm that person with too much exercise, and we see too much of that going on um, where, where wannabe professionals in the industry are assigning people protocol they just aren't ready for. They're not doing accurate assessments, and, and they've been watching too much Biggest Loser nonsense and thinking they've got to yell and scream at people who maybe need a little more tender touch, and they definitely need a more basic introduction into exercise so it becomes something they like, not something they hate. Um, if exercise is going to be something that ends up being bad medicine, um, then it's not likely going to be stuck with for very long. So that's very important as well. So, And uh, don't forget, folks, um, programdesignmasterclass.com. If you want to learn all about the principles and the science and the art of program design, then you got to... Uh, Go to programdesignmasterclass.com and enroll for, for this uh, particular launch. I think we have another week of enrollment and then we'll likely be shutting it down. So uh, we'll go there. Also, uh, when you're watching live, um, um, it helps to hit likes and everything like that. But it also helps with uh, thumbs up or hearts across the screen. Apparently, Facebook, um, that's how Facebook tracks things and, and reaches out for wider audiences and things like that. So I have a few things that uh, I wanted to discuss. Uh, today and then I'll get back to your questions. So um, we're just building an audience here. So I want you to think specifically about a definition of fitness in your own mind, okay? Because you know it's one thing for me to come on live and answer your questions, but that just makes you a passive recipient of information. If your own mind doesn't start working on solutions, you're likely never going to find them. So one of the things I do in my coaching is challenge my clients when they're ready 
to go beyond just getting information from me and getting to actually think about their own solutions and then they can act on it. Something that's empowering and I've, you know, the old analogy, give a man a fish and he eats for a day, teach a man to fish and he eats for a lifetime. Well, that's the coaching approach as well. You have to create empowerment and there's too many wannabe coaches in this industry that are trying to foster dependence, right? They want their clients to be always dependent on them and they sit on high as judge and jury, judging, you know, if they stuck to their diet or if they stuck to their program or, you know, and they, they become some kind of food Nazi for their client. Well, putting your client on edge and having your client feel like they're constantly judged and under pressure, that's also not a situation that's likely going to work out very well. So unless you've got a hyper um, obsessive competitor type mentality, then that kind of coaching um, you know, dictatorship isn't going to work. So coaching is a relationship and it should be a trusted relationship and people should be able to trust going to their coach with whatever issues they, they have, whether it's, you know, you, there could be personal issues affecting um, whether or not someone's able to consistently follow uh, what it's going to take to reach their goals. So they have to, you know, they have to feel comfortable in opening up to a, a coach in that regard. So, um, so that's important. I just got a question. What is my opinion on caloric flux theory? I've never even heard the term. It just sounds like more gobbledygook marketing nonsense to me. Caloric flux. Ooh, doesn't that sound fancy? Um, someone probably made it up to sell something. Um, more power to them, but I don't pay much credence to stuff like that when it comes across my desk. I can almost sniff out gimmicks uh, the minute I hear the terms like that. It almost reeks of gimmickology. So, uh, yes, of course the diets and the hard gainer solution are good for losing fat for someone who's not a hard gainer. Sure, as, as long as you follow the right caloric levels and the diets that are listed in there, why not? That would be good. So I want people to think, like I said, um, I'm going to I'm just going to ask you to hold off on your questions right now and then you'll, you'll ask, her, um, ask them again in a few minutes. But I want to get you thinking, all right? Um, and, then, and then I'll talk more about program design masterclass and things like that. So I want you to think about a definition of fitness. How would you define fitness? And you don't have to write it down, anything like that. <laughs> Sorry, folks, I'm dropping my papers everywhere. But I want you to think in your head of a working definition of fitness and then I want you to think in your head of a working definition of health and wellness. So try scribing that to yourself right now. Try working that out. How would, how would you define the term fitness if a Martian landed, an alien landed today and, and <coughs> wanted to know a def definitions and the first one was fitness and the next one was health and wellness? How would you define those terms? Now I've defined them in my book, The Able Approach. Um, and I've defined them specifically to to point out to people our own paradigm blindness in this industry. So let me use these definitions for you because I often have people with severe body image disorders, eating disorders or whatever, tell me that they're into health and fitness when they don't, they're not even remotely connected to health and fitness. They're completely body and food obsessed and they hide behind terms like um, health and fitness uh, in order to legitimize their disorders and it's anything but wellness. So a lot of times I have to point out that to people, that they're not celebrating and living a life of, of wellness. They're actually living a life of, of illness because they're so obsessed with uh, body image and food and diet and exercise. So um, definition of fitness, okay? Working definition of fitness, you can find this in my book, The Able Approach, is the ability to meet the daily demands of life with ease, with plenty of room to spare, for emergencies and sudden situations, all right? Fitness, all right, defined. The ability to meet life's daily demands with ease, with plenty of energy left in case of emergencies or sudden situations or unforeseen events. Notice it doesn't, that definition of fitness doesn't mention the word exercise at all. You can be completely fit under that term and not ever been in a gym in your life. So when I asked you to think about the term fitness, most of you, probably jumped to a definition that would link physical fitness to the term fitness. Um, and I didn't say that. I said fitness. All right. So we have shrunk the term fitness into fit into some uh, opinion we have that includes exercise. But I've known a lot of healthy, wealthy, well people 
who don't exercise. They have hobbies. They have, they're hobbyists. They do things like tinker on cars, or they do gardening, or they do things like that, or they're globetrotters, or they're trekkies. And they're a lot healthier than a lot of the physically fitness obsessed people uh, that I deal with. So these are terms that you have to know and understand. Now, what about health in terms of wellness? What is health and wellness, okay? Um, hold your questions, folks. I'll get back to you. And my thoughts on ketogenic diet, man. Jason, you got to be follow. If you haven't been following me. I've talked about keto ketogenic diet a, a million times. It's ridiculous. It's stupid. It has no no real basis in the fitness industry other than appearing scientific for the sake of appearing scientific. It's not a need state that anyone needs to respond to. I wish I could just get over that topic, but man, the ketogenic diet is just ridiculous. So, period. I'll talk about and I've written about it. So go to my blog, scottablefitness.com slash blog. You'll find it on there somewhere. My Smarter Sculpted Physique. Uh, I definitely talked about it as well. I think we did a whole episode on the nonsense of keto diets. Um, let's just stop making everything more complicated than it needs to be. So along those lines, what is the definition of health and wellness? Now, I said fitness is the ability to meet uh, the demands of daily life with ease, with plenty of energy left in case of uh, emergency circumstances or sudden situations or unforeseen events. That is a definition of fitness. If you're too exhausted and tired because of your fitness regimen and something comes up in your life you can't deal with or handle, that's not fitness. Uh, no matter whether you've lost 20 pounds or your abs show in the mirror. I know lots of phys physically exercise uh, people who look good on the outside who are really, really ill on the inside. They can't deal with anything in life. So um, that's not fitness. Um, you know, being exercise obsessed or body image obsessed. Now, what about health and wellness? Health and wellness is the ability to meet day-to-day -day life with an attitude of positive energy and positive disposition, free from mental and emotional self-imposed restraints. All right, so health and wellness is defined as the ability to meet day-to-day -day life with an attitude of positive energy and disposition, free from mentally and emotionally self-imposed restraints. Can you imagine that? So in that regard, someone like Stephen Hawking lives in greater wellness than a lot of people who are in, who think they're in the fitness industry, uh, but overwhelm their minds with emotional and mental imposed restraints about food and eating and calories and grams and things like that. So uh, there's a wellness factor to consider. And what I'm getting at is if your regimen of working out and taking care of your body and things like that, if it's not leading to wellness, um, then you're kind of missing the point of all this, right? So that's very, very important as well. Um, and, and you need to think about that. So um, those are definitions I hope make sense to you. Um, you can find them in my book, The Able Approach. This is the second edition. Very proud of this. 400 pages that built on my first edition and I'll show you some uh, other books of mine as well before we before we log off so um, calorie flux theory I'm just reading what the so-called definition of that is it's nonsense sorry um, that's the short answer there I'm not even gonna discuss the merits of it because it has no merit I mean what you just defined for me there is ridiculous, so uh, I won't take that into consideration. Now, I also want to talk a little bit about things like um, binge eating disorder, overeaters. Um, how many people who are on here right now uh, fit into that category? You can just throw some thumbs or some hearts across the screen uh, if you fit into that category, because I sure seem to get a lot of questions on this every week once I log off. Um, so I know there's people that want to hear about it, but maybe they're a little embarrassed to write the questions down and things like that. So there's a lot of things that need to be done to solve that. First, you have to accept that these things are emotional issues, not diet issues. So thinking you're going to hire the next diet to solve these issues is a mistake in stinking thinking. Um, you have to realize and you have to meet the issue at the level of the problem. And a lot of times, the best way of doing that is through journaling work, journaling exercises, okay? And it's funny, a lot of people who I, who I help and I coach who have eating issues will tell me how much they resist journaling work, which means they're, re they're resisting 
finding the solution, which is kind of a, kind of ironic to me. It makes it makes me scratch my head. If if I offer someone a solution and they won't do it, then what does that say about their their true um, their true interest in solving the issue, right? But they want the issue to be solved the way they think it should be solved, which is to focus more on the level of the problem and to focus more on food, uh, and that doesn't work. So one of the things after a binge episode is to sit down and write to yourself in two separate columns, column A, column B, how did this binge episode help me? How did this binge episode hurt me? Okay? Um, and what we're looking for in that first column, how did a binge episode help me? Most people will just be in denial. Oh, it didn't help me. It didn't, you know, like I don't want to do this or whatever. But really, that's what's called, it, there's a payoff to having a binge episode, and you have to seek what that is, and it's called a secondary gain, meaning there's some psychological benefit you're experiencing from a binge episode. Usually it's some kind of emotional relief or emotional release or an emotional numbing of some sorts, right? And you have to, you have to recognize and accept that, that the binging is serving some kind of purpose for you. Uh, the next thing, how did the episode hurt me? Um, you have to realize it hurts you because now it becomes another separate stressor in your life to have to solve and focus on. So a lot of people uh, end up binge eating um, because of stress in their life and then the binge episode itself becomes an added stressor to the stockpile of stressors and uh, it's what we call heaping on the emotional garbage heap um, and that's and that's um, you know that's an issue in itself so you make two columns after an episode how did bin, how did this particular episode help me and then you can get to what whatever was bothering you that you used a maladaptive coping behavior to solve how did this episode hurt me? And you can list all the ways that it hurt you because it becomes another emotional burden on you because now you're focused on food and diet and trying to resist binging again. So that's very, very important as well. And when you journal, it's important to use pen and paper and not a keyboard because it's more intimate and more personal. And journaling is a way of having a conversation with yourself. And a lot of people who have food and binging and eating issues are self-disconnected. So journaling is a way to become self-reconnected or self-connected for the first time. So that's very, very important as well, too. So it's a way of talking to yourself through pen and paper, self-communication that tends to be honest. And it doesn't mean it's going to be perfect the first time. You might have no answers, but that just shows you how disconnected you are, which becomes an answer in itself. So that's important as well. So um, hopefully that made sense. Let me uh, answer some of your questions now. Um, choo -choo -choo. The ketogenic diet's been there, done that. Um, if you're not strong enough on an exercise to do the number of reps, uh, what's a good um, progression? Okay, well, in this case, reverse grip uh, pull-ups. Well, I was never good at pull-ups either. I would suggest just doing a completely other different exercise. I mean, there's no magic in that exercise, so... I would say just do a reverse grip pull down and use whatever weight you can use. That would really um, satisfy that issue. So uh, that that's an important thing as well. So um, a lot of the times just making a smarter exercise selection is a good idea. Uh, and then you can get the reps that are called for. So that's a good idea. There was a, a question I think about uh, program, oh there it is. Uh, program design masterclass. Is it basically for coaches or very experienced exercisers? Well, it's for people who want to learn. Um, I try to do all of my courses and books for people who want to learn nuts and bolts of things and understand research, understand science. Because um, the more you understand, the less you're going to be gullible to online gimmicks and hoaxes and marketing, you know, nonsense. All right. So, you know, I try to write the science of everything and then with the program design masterclass, the reason that's a love of mine is because it's it's also an art. All right, designing programs for people or specific goals and purposes, that is an art in and of itself. So that's a very very important thing. Um, <coughs> so that's programdesignmasterclass.com, programdesignmasterclass.com, and uh, that's very important as well. So you know, for like for instance, in terms of responding to online marketing and gimmicks. This whole notion of pre, peri, and post nutrition, uh, most of the time it's nonsense. Um, it doesn't apply to 99% of the people 99% of the time. 
but the reason it's around in the industry is it sells supplements. So you use some research that applies to a very narrow demographic and then you widen that demographic to say it, it applies to everybody and that's just not true. Unless someone is working at, opt, at maximum work capacity uh, every single day, in other words, unless you're making a living off of working out you know, some kind of professional sport or something, then this whole pre, peri, and post nutrition stuff is just something that doesn't apply to you. And yet everyone wants to think it applies to them, so they'll take, you know, intra workout amino acids and post workout glutamine. And all that does is, is selling useless supplements that you don't need because you're not working at a high enough capacity to deplete your body of those things in a way that would require supplementation. So these are the kind of things that I'm talking about. Uh, to begin with, falling prey to marketing noise and nonsense, all right? That's, um, you know, I've told the story of Gatorade a hundred times and how it came to be, and that it applies to, you know, a very narrow market, but look at its, look at its sales across the globe. It's insanity. But it was manufactured and it was created down at Florida Atlantic University football because they were having two-a-day practices in 100-degree heat with helmets on, which was producing a lot of intracranial heat and they were they were losing excess more than normal amounts of body fluids and body water causing cramping and things like that so in that particular context of hot weather wearing helmets and two a day workouts at max work capacity Gatorade served a purpose but now it's become a drink um, so people get lost they don't even know the research anymore so you know unless you're training at that kind of level there's no advantage to taking things like that. So that's very, very important as well. So hopefully that makes some sense. Um, now I'm getting some questions. Uh, da, da, da. Yeah, so there's some things there. Um, Tracy Lynn, would you say appropriate amount of time to take off with no working out just to reset? Also during that time to keep the diet the same. Well, that's something that I like to assess, Tracy. It's a good question, but um, that's it's hard to sort of paint a brush everybody on that but if people have been going on one of my programs where I'm really I'm not uh, like the earlier question of someone who's overweight and introducing them to exercise if this is someone who's been a client of mine for a while and I'm kind of uh, pushing them a little bit challenging them with their program then at the end of that program I'll probably assign them a week off of diet and training depending on how regimented they've been with both. I mean, if, if they haven't been committed to their diet through the whole 12 to 16 weeks, why give them a week off diet? That doesn't, that doesn't gel, right? So it depends on what I call their need state and where they're at, and then I would assign time off uh, appropriately. Like someone like Andy, he'll go, he'll take many, like one week, one week periods of time off training and diet, but he'll also take two weeks off. Um, if it's after a photo shoot or after a grueling program, and I don't have to assign that to him, to him anymore, he'll write in and say, "I'm thinking uh, at you know this program's coming to an end. I'm thinking I need two weeks now." And after being with me for 13 years, I'll just trust his instincts unless I see something really out of whack. I'll trust his instincts and say, "Sure." So, uh, what are my thoughts on Max OT training? I don't really have thoughts on, on stuff like that. I will say this, folks. Now. A lot of the times people know that I think CrossFit is nonsense, and I have since the beginning, and when it was really, really popular, boy, they came at me in swarms, and then since then, of course, a lot has been written against uh, CrossFit. Now, interestingly enough, um, I would uh, like to just present this question, because I haven't found enough research, but Bob Harper, I don't know if you know that name, but Bob Harper uh, was one of the trainers on Biggest Loser for years, like big famous, you know, um, Biggest Loser show. On, and he became a proponent of CrossFit style workouts, always talking CrossFit this and CrossFit that, or that kind of style of workout, which you know I've been writing against for years. Interestingly enough, at age 51, he recently suffered a heart attack. And when they're interviewing him, he talks about history of heart disease in his family, and that fitness doesn't counteract genetics and things like that but it's ironic that none of them looked at his training protocol and apparently he suffered his heart attack while in the gym training and I put the question out there is Bob Harper another casualty of CrossFit um, because Glassman the creator of CrossFit famously said way back when he created it yes my workouts may kill you that's the price you pay for my work you know nonsense like that um, so it's it's interesting to me that someone who's a so-called expert 
doesn't tie in that maybe the training he was doing, especially with a history of heart disease, maybe that wasn't the smartest style of training he could be doing. And it's amazing to me people don't make these assessments. Instead, they want to rationalize and work around, uh, oh, well, genetics in my family, my mother had a heart attack, this is the kind of stuff he was saying. But what about addressing your training style? What about looking at that and saying, well, with a background history of heart disease in my family, maybe this wasn't the smartest workout choice. So I'm wondering if uh, CrossFit, if Bob Harper's heart attack is another casualty of CrossFit. So I'm just putting that out there as well. So um, the program design masterclass is structured. Um, it's, it's structured in, uh, there, there is a private Facebook group. Um, there is group discussions on there. People go at their own speed. There's several modules on how I break down programs, and we actually take some programs that are in my book, The Able Approach, and we break them, like we actually uh, deconstruct them, and then we reconstruct them in another way to show how to make sort of a five-day program into a three-day program and a metabolic program into an innervation training program. So people have written me about the Program Design Masterclass, and they've asked questions like, well, does your program... Uh, do this and does your program talk about this there's not a program in program design masterclass there's a whole lot of programs in program design masterclass there's three day four day five day six day programs in there and I talk about how to assess an individual how to work protocol how to design protocol we talk about um, dependent and independent variables we talk about constants um, things that you should be aware of when you're designing programs that make sense scientifically and then involve the art of the program design as well. And then in module zero, I talk about the exercise science that should inform any kind of uh, workout program design, things like limit strength, starting strength, speed strength, <coughs> um, said principle, um, uh, overload principle, um, some basics like that, um, and, and why you have to know those things if you're going to design protocol. Like, you have to know things like, for instance, why plyo classes are, are um, a misapplication of exercise principles, because plyometrics is a form of exercise, a tactical implementation designed to improve starting strength, maximum instantaneous fiber recruitment. And when it's overused, as in a class, a couple times a week, it damages joints. So that's very, very important as well. And it'll decrease strength, not increase strength. So um, having a whole class built upon plyometrics is a fundamental all right, bastardization of the principles. And people don't know that. They think they can just go willingly in and create something because they thought of it, it must be a good idea. Not if it violates the principles of exercise physiology, it's not. So that's very important. Um, what are my thoughts about switching up training programs every 21 to 30 days from high reps to low reps? Um, well, uh, again, that's sort of, um, is it the name Drell there? The name's Drell? I, I can't see the... Um, you, if the pro, this is part of my program design masterclass. Um, this arbitrary assignment that has an outside in, oh, every three weeks you have to change a program. Not if your program's well designed, you don't. Um, my programs tend to go 12 to 16 weeks with somebody because it takes at least seven to eight weeks to hit what we call the mastery phase. All right, The introduction phase is the first few weeks where your body's figuring out the consistency of the protocol. Why would you change that just because three weeks is up? We have a fundamental flaw in this industry of thinking everything is an outside-in dictation. No, the actual um, rigors that work is understanding the body from the inside out and listening to what we call biofeedback. So that's another thing discussed in the program design masterclass that it can take six, seven, eight weeks to get to what we call the mastery phase of a program where you subjectively feel the program working better for you regardless of external measurements. So this arbitrary, oh, I'll just uh, switch exercises because it's been three weeks or I'll just switch rep schemes because it's been three weeks. There should be a reason why you're doing that and some of that can be included in, in program design, absolutely. But it should have a basis in principle and it shouldn't just be arbitrarily assigned from the outside in. For instance, you a lot of figure and bikini competitors, they're, they're so-called trainers, the closer the contest gets, the more they cut carbs or calories and increase cardio without paying any attention to that client's biofeedback. I've had clients, I've talked about this in several of my books, 
who were ready so far in advance according to their biofeedback that three or four weeks before their contest, I gave them five days off training and diet to replenish their glycogen, to reboot their metabolism. And people back in the day were, oh, it was all shock and awe. How, how is he doing that? He's going to ruin their physique. And then they would go in and win nationals and win a pro card. So it's all about learning how to listen to the body. So um, Alice says it sounds really advanced. Would a beginner understand? I think... Uh, if you want to understand, you'll understand. So it's, um, I think we break it down pretty well. And the, the book, The Able Approach, comes with it. So um, I think we break it, break it down uh, uh, pretty well. So um, yeah, I think you would. And that's programdesignmasterclass.com. Um, can I explain in more detail about feeling your muscle during the rep but not needing to do slow reps or tempo counts? Um, well, t tempo counts is, again, more of the nonsense of outside in nonsense, right? Outside in dictations. Oh, I'll do a, a two two second concentric and a four second eccentric and a and a one second static hold. That's not how the body works. And I explain in program design masterclass module zero explains where that myth came from in terms of uh, limit strength, concentric strength being a one to one ratio, eccentric strength or static strength. Um, being a two to one ratio, you can hold a weight in place 20% um, longer than a concentric contraction and eccentric phase is 40% stronger than concentric strength. So that's where that myth comes from. However, when you talk about things like um, explosive strength, the ability to use recruited fibers till they're no longer needed, and things like decreased uh, transition time, the time it takes to go from eccentric through static through to concentric, then you're talking about how fast you do that um, increases uh, overload on the muscle. So tempo training is actually another bastardization and a misunderstanding of the principles and what creates what we call that illusion of control, thinking that if you dictate to the body from the outside in, calories, grams, um, tempos, and the rest of it, that you're controlling all the variables, and that's the wrong approach. You should be listening to the body from the inside out and learning how to do that and understanding the principles. Hey, Scott Milne, I didn't know you'd find me on here. Um, yeah, uh, hope you're doing well. Uh, Scott Milne's a former client of mine, also uh, went all the way through the system and got a pro card. Big boy, uh, good to see you on here, Scott. Um, so yeah, and Hard Gainer Solution, folks. Hard Gainer Solution is also now its own website, hardgainersolution.com. That's hardgainersolution.com. And remember the principles, things like for physique development, it's not how much you lift, it's how you lift it. And there's a difference. In the strength training world, the weights work the muscles. In the physique training world, the muscles work the weights. All right, And you have to learn what that means and how to structure it. So, um, yeah, so that's very, very important as well. So, that's programdesignmasterclass.com, programdesignmasterclass.com. But let's talk a little bit more about uh, mental and emotional fitness and how that impacts everything you do. So I want to do, I just jotted down, again, when I come online, folks, uh, again, I'm going to try to make you think every so often. I don't mind imparting information to you, but, you know, um, the more stuff that you can grasp on your own and really think about after the fact, um, that's where real learning comes in, right? Information is not knowledge. Einstein said that. So uh, real learning comes from the doing, as the saying goes. So i got another mental exercise for you. And this one is for the ladies, okay? So ladies, listen up. So I want you to take part briefly. And I, I want you to pretend that it's you yourself answering this question, okay? So if you were writing down or you were with somebody and you yourself were answering this question, I want you in your mind to complete this sentence as if you were saying it, okay? So let's imagine that you're out shopping, all right? And here is you completing this sentence. Does this dress make me look blank? So what's the first word? Play free association in your mind. What's the first word that you would likely associate with the completion of that sentence. Does this dress make me look blank? Okay, now how would you complete that sentence knowing yourself and the way you think and feel um, when you go and try on clothes or bikinis or whatever? So, um, again, think 
You yourself talking and asking the question, does this dress make me look blank? What is the first word in free association that pops into your head? Now, I want you to, um, if, if most of you thought the word fat, does this dress make me look fat, throw some thumbs across the screen so I can, so I can see um, how many free associate with that notion, because uh, that's an important one. Um, so along the lines of, only Julie Starry said the word that I would look for, um, does this dress make me look beautiful? Why is it that the state of mind, and especially the female mind, when it thinks about body image, resorts to negative impacts? Right? Why do you ask yourself things like, does this dress make me look big? Does this dress make me look bloated? Does this dress make me look uh, pear-shaped? Does this dress make me look fluffy? These are, the, these are the comments that are coming in. And you don't understand what an impact that has on how you're going to process things from there on, including things like your body image and stuff. So, actually, um, Julie had it right. Claps, applause to you, Julie. Like, why doesn't your mind freely associate, when it free associates, why doesn't it associate with something positive and empowering? Why does it immediately go to something that's negatively impactful and disempowering? So these things speak to the definition of wellness and fitness that I talked about before. So remember that ability, the definition of wellness is that ability to meet the day-to-day -day life with an attitude of positive energy and disposition free from mentally and emotionally self-imposed restraints. And in that regard, someone like Stephen Hawking uh, is celebrating greater wellness than a lot of people, millions of people who are out there um, defining themselves through diet and exercise. Here's a guy that, as a quadriplegic, becomes a world-renowned physicist, uh, an actor, been on the Big Bang Theory, you know, done appearances on other shows, able to poke fun at himself and his, and his electronic voice and all these things. So that's a state of wellness, um, dealing with your limitations, but reaching for the potential possibilities within all your limitations. So that's very, very important as well. So um, you, you've got to understand things like that. So there's an impact when you're asking the question, even in your own mind, does this dress make me look fat? Because basically you're saying, I'm focusing on negatives and instead of focusing on positives. So that's a very, very important thing as well. So um, moving on. Um, yeah, so that's that's important as well, so keep that in mind. So, uh, other questions, folks, fire them in. This is an Ask Me Anything session. I just wanted to uh, get those points across because they came up during the week and I thought they were uh, pretty important to discuss and deal with and to show you that all these things fit together in your triangle of awareness, okay? So, yeah, um, you know, physique transformation, that's my game. Uh, Smarter Sculpted Physique is my podcast, um, and again, uh, the last week and this coming week, we're relaunching my Program Design Masterclass, and that's ProgramDesignMasterclass.com. Uh, a lot of the other popular things is the, the Cycle.Diet, that's the Cycle.Diet, no dot coms, and that's all about how to use refeeds and cheat days uh, in order to enhance metabolism and not be negatively cosmetically impacted. Um, so that's all explained in that course. And then the Hard Gainer uh, book as well. I think I mentioned that. So uh, a lot of things um, going on and trying to discuss. But again, if it's all confusing to you, then that's where you really should reach out and, and have a coach and have guidance. Because what a coach will do is narrow down your field of vision so that you're less confused and you have one thing to follow. The thing there is find a coach that automatically generates trust. Whatever thing they're saying to you resonates in a field of trust. So in other words, you feel comfortable. If you're going to sign up with a coach that makes you feel uncomfortable from the beginning, that's not a tenable uh, relationship. So, um, so Scott Milne's still here. I thought you just came in and left Scott. So good to, good to see you on here. Good to, good to have you reach out. That's Scott Milne, folks. You can look up him up uh, later, if you want to, uh, Scott, if you want to put in the comment sections, if you're on Instagram or have a website or something, uh, people can track you down and, and uh, yeah, they, they can find you that way. I'm sure they'd be interested in seeing, um, geez, I still, I think I still have that picture of you when you weighed something like 340, 350 when we were bulking you up. Uh, so uh, I appreciate the comments, Scott. That's very nice. So, um, 
So here's uh, just one sec, folks. I'm going to just deep out of the picture for two seconds. <laughs> All right, so just a little reminder here, folks. I've been in this industry uh, for four decades now and at the top of the industry. As Scott Milne can confirm, you know, I helped get Scott in the magazines. Um, myself, I had, I had, I ghost wrote for magazines, I was in the magazines, I um, came up with articles for the magazines, I wrote for magazines, um, all those kind of things. You don't get to the top of the industry and stay there for four decades uh, without knowing something. So uh, it's amazing the trolls who come out when I say something like, keto diet is nonsense and they come out and tell me I don't know what I'm doing so here's just a brief sort of representation alright this is the second edition alright able approach you see second edition of the able approach 400 pages of research and methodology of innovation training physique transformation training metabolic training my met training metabolic enhancement training so that was my first book Here's a book, Permanent Weight Loss, all right? Um, here's another book, The Anti-Diet Approach to Weight Loss and Weight Control, all right, Scott Abel, all right? Understanding Metabolism, Scott Abel. Um, Beyond Metabolism, all right, Scott Abel. The Hard Gainer Solution, all right, by me. Your Truth is Calling, Connecting the Dots to Self-Awareness, my first uh, book on the triangle of awareness, mental, emotional, and physical behavioral fitness. Physique After 50, obviously for my demographic, and The Aging Proposition, also for my demographic. That's just nine books, folks. I've written 20. You don't write 20 books without, one, having a passion for what you do, and two, doing the research that necessitate, necessitates publication. So um, I just wanted to throw them at you. Those are the only hard copies I have available. Now, I show you hard copies. Um, if you're ordering books from scottablefitness.com, you're only going to get downloads, so keep that in mind. Uh, but you can print them out. You can print out a page, a chapter, whatever. And I just wanted to illustrate that, folks, that you know I don't come by my opinions uh, willy-nilly. I've been invested in this industry um, since I got started in the 80s and that's a long long time being at the top of a mountain all right without being knocked off so um, I think that speaks to real expertise it's not just about an opinion and you know we all know that online these days you can find an opinion everywhere but it's about having an experienced informed educated academic referenced opinion okay so those are the things that mark expertise okay so you know I pride myself on the care I take um, to forming my opinions and my methodologies and so I don't come at them frivolously so people should know that obviously when we do Facebook live of course we're going to um, attract people who have never heard of me don't know what I do Obviously, my physique days are well behind me. I wouldn't, and I wouldn't have it any other way. I'm not trying to relive my youth at age 55. I've been there, done that. You know, earn the T-shirt, earn the hat, as the saying goes. Um, <coughs> um, so, yeah. So those are just some of the hard copy books I have, but I've written 20 of them. Um, so, you know, you can go to scottablefitness.com and and read a book and decide for yourself. So, um, yeah. So that's, you know, that's, that's something to consider as well. And I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, again, you've seen the Thursday Facebook Live sessions with fitness supermodel Andy Sinclair, who actually picked up and moved his life here to Kelowna so he could just be around and, and do projects with me and, and absorb more and learn more and, and talk about taking big steps in life to get what you want. I mean, that's a pretty huge step. Andy moved out here not knowing anybody, not having any relatives out here. Um, yeah, so that's pretty, pretty, uh, a big move. So I always respect people who, who take big moves in life. If you saw my, uh, my last post on Facebook, actually, it was a quote card that I made and it just said a lot of you are very sincere about, ch are very sincere about changing your life. You're not, just not very serious when it comes to doing it. And someone like Andy who, 
packed up his life and moved out here. I think that I think that speaks volumes to someone who's, you know, putting their their money where their mouth is, so to speak. <clears throat> so that's a, a very big deal uh, in terms of knowing and understanding folks. One of the coaching realities is your behavior always tells you what you really want. So there'll be people saying, oh, I really wanted to stick to my diet, but, 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 but. No, your behavior tells you in that moment what you really wanted. Even if it's binge eating and you tell yourself till you're blue in the face you don't want to binge eat, your behavior is telling you that you do. So if you're going to get home from a busy day at work and order pizza because you're too tired to cook and that's your excuse, well, that's your behavior telling you what you really want in that moment. So you can have indulgence or you can have progress, but you can't have both at the same time and think you're going to get anywhere. If you're going to only stick to what it takes to reach a lofty goal when it's convenient for you to do so, you're never going to get there. And that's what marks the difference between being your own champion and just telling yourself you want something. There's a difference between a fantasy and actualizing a goal. So that's very, very important as well. So we have to keep these things in mind. So, um, yeah, so very, very important, folks. Um, and if you are over 50, I'm getting some comments in. Yes, for sure. Physique after 50. Um, you know, there's been some industry big wigs that have recently ordered uh, my book, Physique After 50, which uh, I've reached out to them. Maybe I'll have them on my podcast, and that would be nice. So, um, uh, Amina, what's more important, in my opinion, diet or training? Depends what you're trying to accomplish. Um, you, a blend of both would make the most sense, uh, but it has to be right diet and right training. So, I mean, that's the important thing, right? It's not practice makes perfect. It's, and it's not perfect practice makes perfect because that breeds obsession. It's excellence, okay, uh, is what you need to practice. So what's more important, diet or training? Well, that depends. If you're going to be someone who goes on a freaking nine-day cleanse and then takes up keto dieting and then vegetarianism where you're only eating lettuce and radishes all day long, then that's not good. Um, and if you're someone going to the gym training till you get to the point of rhabdomyolysis, which is big in the news these days, because you're training yourself into the ground, that's not good either. So what's good is right training and right dieting and a blend of those together. Remember, a diet has to serve two purposes. It must be sustainable and it must serve the body. All right. So within that, you can't focus just on, I want to be this percent body fat. Well, if that's not serving your body and it's not sustainable, there's going to be metabolic consequences for that. So it's I follow the Buddha eight principles, and one of them is right thinking and right attitude will lead to right behavior. And that's something that I try to mold with my coaching clients. I try to mold them. Most of them don't reach their goals because they have stinking thinking and they don't even realize it. So what I try to do is reorient them, well, what we call cognitive restructuring, get them to do right thinking, and the right thinking will lead to right acting. Right acting and right behavior reinforces right attitude, which reinforces right thinking, which reinforces right behavior, and then the whole, the whole circle keeps completing itself. Because it's amazing how many people who follow the regimented lifestyle don't see it as a struggle. It's not an added stress in their life, it's stress release in their life. And that's an important thing as well. We did that a couple Saturdays ago, we did that workout number 17 from my hard gainer solution with Trevor Timmons of the Montreal Canadiens who travels more than 200 days a year all over the globe and um, you see the kind of condition he's in. When you look at that, you can find that on my YouTube channel uh, under the Coach and Andy Show playlist, and you can see that. So, um, Here's another question. Will the Physique After 50 program videos be made available? Um, I think, yeah, I think actually the Physique After 50 program is in the Program Design Masterclass, I'm pretty sure, um, and how and why that was developed. Uh, Tracy, aside from the fat burning aspect, which are obviously um, not the key, is there any benefit to doing steady state cardio? Well, uh, and then you say like running, cycling, or stairs. Well, running and jogging are a big no-no in my book. Uh, the most injured, uh, normal, regular, day-to-day -day people who exercise, the most injured people who show up in emergency rooms are runners and joggers, uh, by far. It's not even close compared to weight training injuries. It's, it's in, not even in the same stratosphere, okay? And unless you're built for running, running over time is gonna wreak havoc on your knees 
and havoc on hip alignment. And as you get older, that's going to become more and more problematic. Um, so that's really an important consideration. Now, I prefer upright cardio for people, which means um, treadmill, Stairmaster, elliptical, things like that. Never running. Never ballistic pounding on the ground, okay? Um, and is there an advantage to it? Uh, yeah, there's an advantage to all forms of exercise. Um, it's just not going to be a fat-burning and cosmetically advantageous one. So that's what people uh, need to keep in mind. Only resistance training, weight training, properly structured, is going to transform a physique. And you can look at my client JP's transformation, who went from looking pear-shaped to looking, uh, went from looking pear-shaped, all right, and slouchy with a bad posture, to looking uh, triangle-shaped. Uh, by doing the cycle diet, which means no deprivation, no weighing and counting carbs and all that stuff. And you can see the transformation he had where people were questioning whether it was even the same person. And he's maintained and sustained that for over uh, two years now. So you can find that. I've posted his uh, before and afters um, you know, several times so you can see that um, as well. So um, any worries on testosterone supplementation and and prostate cancer correlation. Actually, that, that prostate cancer correlation has been um, debunked. Um, in the early days of hormone replacement therapy, they thought there was a connection, and then the most recent research shows that actually some testosterone um, replacement therapy can actually um, increase prostate health. So I think it was 2015, August 2015, I wrote a blog on hormone replacement therapy. And even, um, ironically enough, uh, for women, um, uh, postmenopausal women are now benefiting immensely from um, having some testosterone replacement therapy along with their other um, um, uh, female hormone replacement therapies. So you can read all about that, I believe, at scottablefitness.com slash blog. I think it's August 2015, so uh, very important there. And what about swimming? Sure. <coughs> Swimming's good. The only thing about swimming is... Since you offset body weight, you don't get that resistance factor from body weight. It's a lot better for your joints, but um, going to be a lot less uh, demanding. You're going to have to do a lot more of it to get the same result you would get from other forms of, of uh, aerobic training. So that's important as well. Um, so And then we define things. In the Program Design Masterclass, we define things like aerobic strength versus anaerobic strength and what that means and the energy systems that feed them. Uh, so that's very important as well. So, uh, yeah. And, and uh, oh, it just uh, Facebook just showed me that uh, Eric Taylor just shared my video. I appreciate that, folks. The more shares and reach that we get, um, the more people we can attract on Sundays. Uh, please don't try to keep my breakfast with the coach a secret. <laughs> uh, that's not why I'm on here. I'm trying to benefit people. So, uh, you know, the bigger reach we get, um, the better. I'd rather people get good, solid information than what passes for good, solid information out there. Um, so that's very important as well. So I appreciate the share, uh, Eric, the shout out. Um, yeah. Um, Bioidentical hormones. Uh, I don't want to get too into like lecturing people on stuff where there's sort of a tribal connection. Um, I don't believe in bioidentical hormones. I, I don't see any good science in it, but I know people that swear by it, so, um, you know, to each their own. Just do your research is what I would suggest, um, and that's important as well. So, uh, very important stuff. Um, <coughs> so, hopefully those few exercises that we did um, helped you. Um, and someone wrote in and wanted me to speak about uh, pre, peri, and post exercise nutrition, so we did that. Um, and I talk about whatever you guys want to talk about every Sunday, even though I'll often come in here with um, a few things that I want to point out, particularly in this one, the definition of fitness, the definition of wellness, things like that. Appreciate all the thumbs up and the hearts and things like that. Uh, great. Yeah, so keep in mind um, where you can find those, those most popular things. Oh, the cycle diet book. I didn't show you that one. Um, that must have been, so that would have made 10 books, unless I did show you that one. Can't even remember. Anyway, that must be in the in the dungeon. Uh, must be using it for another time. So, um, so yeah, programdesignmasterclass.com if that's what you're interested in. Um, I don't see that Scott Milne posted his uh, um, social media information, but maybe he will later, or maybe he's gone. So, 
Uh, anyway, um, you can find all of these uh, live Facebook live videos. Um, I do post them to my YouTube channel now. After the fact, I just don't reveal too much of what's in them. So you'll find a lot of gems of information within them. And uh, again, um, you can find out you know more. I've written tons of blogs, or you can follow me, um, Smarter Sculpted Physique Podcast. Uh, we have that. Um, many episodes you can catch up on, like I said, the Facebook Live previous sessions, not all of them, but some of them are on my YouTube channel. And then uh, stay tuned every Sunday for now, and every Thursday I come live with the Coach and Andy show, and we come live, uh, Andy, with the Anatomy Chart uh, Fitness Model Physique comes on and demonstrates exercises and things like that, and if you're so interested. So is there uh, any other questions? Um, food, diet, training? Um, I think there was something, I think Lily asked a question, sorry, let me try to find that, Lily, their comments came in so fast, there was something about a 7 to 7, um, thing, <coughs> uh, yeah, I can't, oh. well, you know, there, it's a mythology, folks, that you've got to eat your last meal, um, <clears throat> you know, specifically so many hours before bed. Calories need to be balanced throughout the day. And that's all you need to know about unless you're a really high-level athlete. And most of my people, especially the ones, remember, a diet has to serve the body and be sustainable. So I eat right before bed. I wouldn't call what I eat a meal, but I eat something right before bed. So does Andy, who stays in super lean shape year-round. So do a lot of other of my clients who stay in super lean shape. So this myth that you have to stop eating or... Your body's going to store the food as fat. You don't have to eat and then be active. I don't know where this myth came from that we have to eat and then go burn off all the calories. I mean, that's just desperation thinking. It makes no sense at all. So eating right before bed can actually stimulate the neurotransmitters that invite calm. And then that invites sleep. So, you know, part of good sleep hygiene is a regular pre-bedtime ritual uh, and then, you know, the food can be part of that, like a, a, just a little something to stimulate those neurotransmitters that invite calm and then invite sleep. So very important. One of the things that work against that is having screens that are backlit. So if you're in bed and you're having sleep issues and you're on your iPad or your iPhone before bed, well, that's one issue that's causing your disrupted sleep. Um, the research is pretty clear on that. I've written blogs about that as well. Um, but here's another way marketing works because I see infomercials all the time with these cheesy guys showing people who are disrupted sleep and they're tossing and turning and, and magically it's their pillow, all right? So they need the magic pillow and then suddenly they're sleeping, they're sleeping beauties, right? Well, let's think about that for a minute. Is really the cause of adult disrupted sleep and insomnia really someone's pillow? It, very, it might be in a very low percentage of people, but usually it's stress. Um, usually it's, it's not practicing very sound health practices. Usually it's anything but your pillow or your mattress, right? But how do they use this to market to you? Well, if you're desperate enough with sleep disruption, then maybe you will <coughs> celebrate what we call your wish bias and think that maybe a pillow is a solution or a mattress is a solution. And it's the same thing in the fitness industry with diet and supplements, that the hope that this thing is maybe what you need. When what you need is ritual and regimentation, what you need is the non-sexy stuff, all right? But you're always gonna be marketed to with the sexy stuff because it appeals to our wish bias. So that's very, very important as well. Um, and if you understand wish bias, that becomes a very, very big thing. Um, hang on, I'm scrolling through. There was a, yeah, why we emotionally eat and, and eating and boredom and stuff. Well, I talked about that earlier on. You must have just joined us, Cindy. I talked about uh, sitting down and making two columns, what this behavior does for me, what this behavior does to me in terms of um, rewards versus consequences. Those are things that you have to journal about to understand. If you're eating when you're bored, then stop doing things that, that lead to boredom. I'm usually a bored mind. Uh, you know, if you engage a mind, then it won't be bored. Um, you know, things like that. So again, change the mindset, change the behavior, okay? In terms of, and, and then your question actually speaks um, to, the, to the illustration of the problem. Tactics to stop. 
right? So you're looking at behavior modification to solve something that is actually uh, a stinking thinking issue. So you have to think differently in order to act differently. Um, and those journaling prompts that I gave earlier in this uh, live session, if you go back and rewatch this later, you'll see those journaling prompts can help you do that. <coughs> Tactical stuff won't work for long. So you can use stopgap stuff um, as a stopgap, but if you don't change what's permanently driving an unwanted behavior, then it's going to continue. It's, habits are automatic neural events. So if you don't find a way to create a new habit, your wiring for the old habit will take over. Um, and that's very, very important as well. So don't, you don't have to apologize, Cindy. You just rewatch this and, and you'll see that I discussed that um, about um, people with food and eating issues. And I'll discuss a little of it each time. Um, we'll drip a little bit of that. But usually it takes ongoing interaction with someone outside your mind to challenge and show you the ways that your thinking is actually what's creating the unwanted behavior. So as Einstein said, we never solve an issue at the level of thinking that causes it. Okay, so too often people who are have eating and food issues, they become experts in the problem but bewildered in the solution. So they keep thinking that if they endlessly analyze the problem, they're going to somehow find a solution. And no, you're just going to become more and more entrenched in the problem by doing that. You're not thinking at the level of solution. You're still trapped in the level of problem. So we call that, I call it stinking thinking. Um, you need a cognitive restructuring. And the reason that is, is you're trapped in having your mind trying to move away from what you don't want which makes you anchored in, a, in that exact thing. Instead, you want to program your mind to move toward what you do want so that you're triggered towards something positive rather than anchored in something negative. So hopefully that, that makes some sense as well. So, um, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, people are giving some thumbs up for the podcast, Smarter Sculpted Physique podcast. Um, appreciate that. Um, and again, you can see that mindset awareness has a lot to do Anyone can reach a physical goal. Can you sustain it? Can you keep it? Um, there's too much online stuff that markets to what I call the weight loss tourist. Okay, Do you want to be a weight loss, fat loss tourist or do you want to be a permanent resident? Okay, Getting there is only one thing, but if you only are always thinking about the level of getting there, then you're never going to be able to stay there. And that's, that makes you a weight loss or physique transformation tourist. All right. If you want to be a permanent resident, it requires a whole different level of thinking. So that's very, very important as well. Uh, Cindy, you're welcome on that. So uh, any other questions for this round of um, Facebook Live? Hopefully you've all turned your clocks ahead. And again, uh, the podcast, Smarter Sculpted Physique, check that out. These previous Facebook Lives are um, bre Sunday Breakfast with the Coach on my YouTube channel and Thursdays, uh, the Coach and Andy Show. Um, you know, I talk a little bit about the topics. And right now, uh, programdesignmasterclass.com um, and the cycle.diet and hardgainersolution.com tend to be the most popular. But as you see, if you go to scottablefitness.com, you can bone up on a lot of previous blogs and my other 13 or 14 books as well. So um, hopefully you got some good insight from this session. And, um, you know, by all means, send in your questions. I, I you know, for next live cast or write them down and then tune in next week. And uh, in the immortal words of a once famous bodybuilder, I'll be back.